And sometimes I wonder, I look like that? That's what I look like? Huh, that's weird, right? And, and it was a reminder for me that first, I alone can never fully see the whole picture of myself. Hello, and thank you for joining us today online as we begin our new series called Intertwine, all about our relationships. And I want to start with one focal point, and this is the focal point. We have been created in the image and likeness of God. That is a humongous statement that we come in carrying intrinsic value because we've been made by God for God and called into responsibility with God as co-workers and co-laborers of creation. That's life with God. And listen, God in himself is a relationship. I want us to take that in. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit who are separate but one, coexisting, co-working, and co-glorifying one another. And we too are made to be in relationship with God, creation, and with one another. Today I want to begin with a relationship that can be easily overlooked and forgotten, yet it is vital for us to like focus on and emphasize, and that's the relationship with ourselves. That's right. I can personally say that self-awareness for much of my life was not on the radar. I just said I knew I know who I am, right? It wasn't on the radar until probably my late 20s where I noticed things and issues about myself that I kind of, you know, put in the background with busyness and with like aspirations. But then I could feel the sadness and the anger really amounting, but I continued to numb it. And, and, and it was for my survival, right? This is what I've been doing all my life. This was the mechanism that I used, the numbing, the busying, the continuing on, avoiding my pains and my issues, which ultimately led to an emotionless demeanor. That's what I would carry most of the time. It was a self-induced method for dealing with all of that chaos. And I've really noticed that come to a head on this one moment, it was when we had our daughter, Sianna, when she was born. I remember holding her in my arms, my baby girl, my firstborn, this, this, this child that I love, and inside, I felt nothing. That's right, nothing. It was numb. I was dead inside. I could not be present in the moment I knew something was really wrong here. And this began my quest for healing and because I could not give my family this broken version of me for the rest of their lives. They deserve better. And guess what? I deserve better. And at the age of 29, which was years later, I had one of my many breakthroughs emotionally that I've been battling for years. And what I've been battling was the abuse that I received from childhood, the neglect, and, and it was the physical, mental, and emotional, and spiritual complexity that took part in the early stages of my life, which resulted in a torment of sorts where I would have outbursts of anger and rage and frustration and I would take on rebellious and risky behaviors. I would have seasonal depression around Christmas, around my birthday, these big days, and I would just chew them off like they didn't really exist. But these things, these memories, these moments, they began to haunt me and lead me into shame, then anger, then me hiding and isolating some more, pulling away from the very people that I needed to be present for. So I wanted better, and I, but I didn't know how to heal or move forward. It took a choice of going into my pain, not walking away from it, for going into self-understanding to begin to heal with the Holy Spirit's help in my life. And I share this because this might be your story. And it doesn't need to be your future. Does this mean I don't still deal with those things? No, not at all. I still have outbursts. 
ask my family, right? I still have very sad moments. But listen, healing is not always getting over it. Most of the time, healing is the ability to live with it in a healthy way without train wrecking. Well, are you still with me? Let's keep building on this. Now, how many of you you've spent time in front of a mirror today? I hope many of you have. I think most, we take a glance, one or two, as we begin our day. But this is not always true. I'm not going to name names in my family, but there are some people who go out into this world not caring what they look like. Mismatched socks, stains, hair going all, his shirts backwards, not a care in the world. But the, for the rest of us humans, we take a glance <laughs> and pay attention to ourselves. Now let's take this to another level. I find it strange that when I look into a mirror, I don't see myself like totally, right? I don't see myself like in, in the perspective that everyone else sees me, that maybe you see me. I notice this when I look at a photograph and sometimes I wonder, I look like that? That's what I look like? Huh, that's weird, right? And, and it was a reminder for me that first, I alone, can never fully see the whole picture of myself. And second, it takes work and perspectives, like looking at all the perspectives, to see myself as I truly am. It's complicated and we need help. It seems the more confident that I think I know who I am is the very sign that I don't. Because self-awareness is hard to see alone, but it's essential to my life. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this in James 1, 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues continues in it not forgetting what he's heard but doing it they will be blessed in what they do little brother james of jesus right james the brother of jesus giving us insight into self-awareness and it makes perfect sense because he was not aware right and and this is true spiritually and practically in our lives encouraging us to be in reflection, to constantly close the gap between our actions and our confession of faith. Here, the mirror is our reflection into the Word of God, into Jesus Himself, which reflects our inner spiritual state and our intentions. The mirror does not only show how we, it, how we appear, it shows us who we really are. The mirror is the confrontation with the truth about ourselves, which is crucial for self-awareness, recognizing sin, and our absolute need for grace, which brings us into a humble state. Not by comparing to one another, but ultimately comparing to the life of Jesus, which is our highest aim. The danger, James points out, though, is the danger of our forgetfulness, right? We forget. We have a bent to ignore our internal state, to be self-deceived. Listen, no one lies to you more than you. No one has told you more horrible things more than you. No one has put you in worse situations more than you. There are many times we deceive ourselves. This means we need to engage the mirror or the Word of God regularly to reflect. Taking steps in our aim to be with and like Jesus, to walk with Him, imitate Him. That is the Christian life, ultimately. In the word of Socrates, he said the words, Know thyself. He said it because he knew it wasn't easy, because it would be uncomfortable to go into who, our inter, inner state, right? We would rather put on our Sunday best than put on our avatar selves, which we have been building for most of our lives to keep ourselves safe. It's not because you were trying to fool everyone to hurt them. No, you were trying to keep yourself 
from being her safe. And I know that in some of your situations, you needed to do that for survival. <laughs> Yet how exhausting, how isolating. It's not good to remain there. Yet if you fake it till you make it, you just might not make it. It might break you. Church people, you don't always have to be blessed and good all the time. Blessed and highly favored. We have hard days, hard seasons. And when we fake it, it puts the pressure around those around us to fake it too. And it permeates the community after a while to fake it because everyone seems like they're good. Then what happens when you struggle, when you can't keep it together, when you're hurting, when you're afraid? You might think something's wrong with me because look at everyone else. They're doing great. I, I can't fix this. What's wrong? Then shame rolls down hill, making you feel so small and overwhelming you, isolating you, making you believe the opposite of the image of God you have been created into. It's so important for us Christians, the church, to create spaces of grace for all of us, spaces of weakness, spaces for healing and vulnerability. Blessed are the poor in spirit when you finally, when I finally realize that we are weak at the table of God, that we do not bring power and might into the table of God. He is power and mighty. He is good. We are the poor in spirit. And when we finally get a grip of that, then the kingdom of heaven will be unleashed on us. Why? Because we can see it in all the spaces, the graces of God, the goodness of God. We need vulnerability in the church. We need vulnerability as followers of our Rabbi Jesus. I call this, this uh, there's a metaphor I call called the fat guy at the pool. Have you ever noticed the first fat guy at the pool who takes his shirt off, allows all the other fat guys, I understand this, freedom to take off their shirt. No one wants to be in the pool with their Steve Jobs turtleneck on. No, no one. Honest, but honest self-understanding and the willingness to share our fears has a way of setting other people free. They say, me too, I feel like that. Because we are more alike in our weakness than our strengths. In the same way, I challenge us to create a reality where we can shed off our protective self in order to live out our true self. Augustine wrote in, his, in the work of Confessions, How can you draw close to God when you are so far from yourself? Ouch, right? But he saw it back then, how that was played out. Think about that. <clears throat> this is not just an issue we face today. This is a human issue. This is a Garden of Eden issue. John Calvin wrote, Nearly all the wisdom which we possess consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the self. If you want to heal, you got to deal with yourself. If you want to grow, you got to know yourself. Vast amounts of people go to the grave without knowing who they are, living someone else's life someone else's expectations of their life and maybe of your life. Today, would you continue the deep work asking the hard questions? Why am I so impatient? Have you asked yourself that? Or did you just blame? Why am I over responding or, over, or under responding to what's going on? Why am I so anxious? Why am I ducking this conversation? Why do I need him and her to validate me and tell me that I'm okay? Why do I live with this constant low-grade depression? Why am I feeling so much shame? Why do I, am I surrounded yet feeling alone? Why am I so avoidant to this? Why is John talking so much? You might be asking that. But yes, yet once we purposely slow down, pay attention, and listen and reflect inwardly to ourselves and to God, we can begin to become the person God created, created us to be. It's much easier to pretend and medicate with busyness and doing stuff, at least for a while. But it all catches up and it begins to crack. Or we mentally and physically get sick. 
reaping what we've been sowing and planting in ourselves. Here are my last two thoughts. In the life of David, he made a lot of mistakes, but he knew who he was. That's why I like David. He messed up big. He ran after God big, too. As he went out into battle that one day with Goliath, he was not trained like the other soldiers. He knew he wasn't King Saul, nor his brothers. David was a shepherd. That's right. David was a shepherd. He had been with God in the wilderness, and he knew himself. And this identity freedom from the pressure of his family, King Saul, his brothers, the people of Israel, so that David could be the David God made David to be. Listen, God cannot bless who you pretend to be. In the words of Rabbi Susia, I end like this. At the end of your life, God will not ask you, why were you not more like Moses? God will ask you, why were you not more like you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray even now, as we hear these words, that we would take our first steps towards ourselves, our relationship with ourselves. It's so easy to trick and lie to ourselves and say, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Instead of looking within, with the Holy Spirit, to reveal those areas in ourselves that we have been running from, hiding out. Lord, would you let them appear so we can heal and deal with ourselves with you through the word of God, drawing close to you, Jesus. In your name we pray.